I'm Deputy Dean in a Faculty of Computing, Engineering and Media at De Montfort University. Um, but I still make and create virtual experiences. I write a lot. Um, I, I really enjoy what immersive gives us. Um, so, so that's a bit about me. This is me flying, obviously. Um, there, there's an element of flying throughout this talk, um, which, which you'll find. Um, but this is within a virtual experience where I was learning how to fly. I was doing a history of flight. Um, which was a great setup, a really interesting um, piece, um, but it is also just a really nice photogenic location. Um, I also spent 48 hours living in VR a couple of years ago. I was taking it to the extreme. I was trying to work out whether we could really live our whole lives within virtual reality, which given how this year has gone um, and we're doing more things virtually, um, we're working in different environments. Um, it, was, it was quite a good experience. So this was a couple of years ago, but we spent 48 hours living within virtual reality to really understand what it was like. And I'll play a very short clip now um, so you can see the kinds of things that we did. Are you looking forward to this experience? <laughs> And yes. I wish you had another tattoo. <laughs> I'm never doing this again. <laughs> So through all of that experience, it was about looking at real life and how that merges with the virtual life to really try and get a different understanding about virtual reality and immersive media. Um, and what was quite interesting, it was that blending of the, the real and the virtual um, in things like when walking on a plane, um, driving a car, eating, all those kinds of things. Um, it was a lot of fun, um, but quite a long 48 hours. Um, so it's probably safe to say that I do like technology. Um, I do like immersive media and I love virtual reality. What I want to talk to you about today, though, is about immersive storytelling and how it has the potential to find new audiences for journalism. I'll talk probably for about 30 minutes or so. Um, I can go on and on and on though, so you must stop me. Um, but I will make sure that we've got some breaks for questions and discussions, because um, I want to really hear from you as well, because I think you'll have some great insights into immersive media. So I want to start with a problem. And this is the problem with news. Um, and I say that as a journalist talking to a group of journalists, um, but it is recognizing that we do have a problem with news. It's recognizing that there is a decline, um, changes in where we get our news from, trust in the news industry, trusts in journalists as well. And that's before we go on around accusations of fake news that have really dominated the news agenda over the past few years. But I want to give a solution. And for me, that solution is my granny and it's immersive journalism. And that's where our solution to the problem of news is. Solution might be going a bit too far. I'm not going to suggest that through using these technologies, technologies like augmented reality, virtual reality, or 360 degree filming, that we can save the news industry. But what we can do is harness the power of the technology. And through harnessing that power and its application within journalism, it can help us to reach new audiences can help us to change our understanding of news and maybe even question what news is for. 
So what I want to go through exactly is what we're talking about at the moment. And I, I'm going to ask for a show of hands. Hopefully I can see hands in this. I can see a few of you, but I'm hoping I'll be able to see virtual hands as well. And that's starting off with that question is how many of you have experienced virtual reality? Can I have a show of hands? Has anybody experienced virtual reality? No, okay, that's really interesting. Um, and okay, we can go into that a bit more a bit later. Um, and I will send you some links of ways that you can experience it um, later on in the talk and different links for some of the things that I'll be talking about. So when it comes to immersive journalism, what we're talking about is back at the start um, in 2010. So in 2010, Nolly de, Nolly de la Pena, um, who is a researcher, um, former journalist who works at the University of Southern California. So in around 2010, she spoke about immersive journalism, but really in the context of just virtual reality. So she said immersive journalism is a production of news in a form in which people can gain first person experiences of the events or situation described in news stories. And the fundamental idea of immersive journalism is about allowing the participant, typically represented as a digital avatar, to actually enter a virtually recreated scenario representing the news story. Now, De La Pena did this in a number of ways, and it was really exciting at the time and helped us to understand that merge, merging of the real and the digitally recreated and the virtual. So she did this by live recording environments, the audio in those environments, and merging it with computer simulations. So hunger in LA was one of these examples, and I'll come on to that later on in the line. Um, so Hungry in LA took the audio recording of people standing outside a food bank in Los Angeles. And whilst they were there recording this sounds, and it was all the sounds that you'd imagine in a food bank, people talking, the road sounds, sirens, everything in that environment. And whilst they were there, a man collapsed. It was a diabetic man. And everyone gathered around and the paramedics arrived. So Noni de la Pena's team had this really rich audio recording of the sounds of a food bank. And what they did was recreated this digitally in virtual reality. So you could have this experience of what it was like being in that environment. It was digitally recreated, you were an avatar and you were standing in the line. And the piece really helped bring an audience to the news event in VR through that combination of the real and the digitally recreated. But all of this isn't really new. And many of you, I'm sure, are really familiar with those first person accounts in news. And I always like to go back to the olden days, um, back in the, the time of Hunter S. Thompson, gonzo journalism, Tom Wolfe and the new journalism movement, um, and Truman Capote, who is a big, big favourite of mine. With the new journalism movement and the gonzo journalism movement in the 60s and 70s, um, this was all focused around the ideas that the journalist becomes part of the story. And it's a subjective account of being part of the story that helps to, you to understand what the story is all about. It's our first hand account. And the idea was that that would convey a deeper understanding of the news. So what you could do then is tell that first person account and the audience would get a deeper understanding. And that's been featuring quite prominently in news as the digital has increased. It was very prominent back in 2000 in television news where you had the emphasis on the reporter. Um, the reporter is a celebrity, this star reporter that would take you to a news event and help, to, help you to understand the story. It was the emphasis on them having a closer connection to the story. And I think what's really interesting at this point is to kind of think about what journalism is to you and what the journalist is to you and what that role of the reporter is. And are you there to be a guide 
to introduce an audience to the story and to tell it through your own lens? Or are you then on the sidelines? Are you at a critical distance to the story, anonymous by all accounts? And the answer that you have in your head will kind of give you quite an understanding and determine your own views on immersive journalism and whether you think it could save news. If it is the former, if it is that idea that you are there to introduce somebody to a story, to take them through your experiences, then you might be giving immersive journalism a thumbs up. Because what immersive journalism is doing is taking you, the reporter, out of the equation and it replaces you with the audience. The audience effectively becomes the reporter. You're handing over all your power and all your control as the journalist and giving it to the audience. The audience is then in the field to observe and to experience and create your own understanding of what's happening. Immersive journalism is about allowing the audience to step into the story and experience it for themselves. The journalist as the storyteller is simply replaced. You don't watch a story in immersive journalism, you feel a story. And that distinction is key. It's also really difficult to get your head round and unlearn all the lessons that you're taught and that are so important and critical to journalism because you are changing the very nature of what journalism is. So to sum up that, immersive journalism is about transporting the audience to experience it for themselves. And we can do this through a range of different technologies. We can do AR, VR, or 360. So we're gonna take a moment to just go through some of that and a brief history of immersion, which I think is really important because it's not new. And you'll hear from lots of people like me, all very, very excited about new technology, forgetting that it has been around for a very long time. So this first picture is back in 1960, and this is Morton Halick, who was a researcher, a computer scientist out in LA, and he created this chamber and it was called the Sensorama. And his idea was that you would put your head inside a chamber and you would feel this experience. So you would be transported to flying through the streets of New York and you would feel the wind in your hair and the smells from the street. Nobody thought it would work. Then we had more of a breakthrough in 1965 with Ivan Sutherland who created the, the first virtual reality headset. And this headset was so heavy that it had to be hung from the ceiling because you couldn't carry the weight of it on your own head. We then saw further developments. We've got images there from NASA of, of people using virtual reality for training. In 1992, the more immersive caves started appearing, um, which were more of an artistic form. And then the Nintendo Boy in the 90s, something very, very popular with so many people not popular enough to make it sustain and it still made people feel quite nauseous. Um, but then we had a bit of a breakthrough from 2010 onwards when these ideas around immersive journalism were really arriving. We had Google Glass in 2013, a real breakthrough. Um, it wasn't successful in many ways, but it did open up the opportunity of what augmented reality would be. We had Facebook purchasing Oculus, we had Google Cardboard all in 2014, and then we had a range of headsets being developed. And that's where we are now. Headsets are getting more affordable. There's more access to them than before. There's less reliance on big, full-blown computers to power headsets, which make it very, very unaffordable um, for, for most people and very difficult to get mass consumption. So we are getting into a place where things are more accessible. It's also worth looking at how we access this technology. So we do have headsets. 
headsets. Um, and these are headsets that are either powered by computers or standalone headsets. So I have here this um, Oculus um, Quest, which was the first edition of the Oculus Quest, which was the first headset that you don't need to rely on a big computer for, um, which was really, really good. So really big breakthrough. We have mobile VR. So we have the headsets that hold your phone. Um, Google Cardboard, as an example, um, Samsung Gear and other headsets are available. And that takes use of the, um, the, the technology in your phone, which allow you to tilt and rotate. And you can do that tilt and rotate without a headset. And you'll have seen that within kind of social media where people are using 360 degree cameras and they allow you to look around the environment on your phone. Obviously, that's a lot less immersive, but it does, does help you get to that place. And you can also do that with web VR. So web VR browsers that allow you to look through an environment with a mouse on your computer. And then we come to the immersive spectrum. So one end, we have 360 degree films. So these are effectively the same as normal films. It's conducted through a, a camera and they're cameras which create the whole environment. Now, back when I was starting, I used to have to make GoPro rigs with little GoPros all over and then stitch them together in an edit to create a spherical shot. That was really, really tricky and very, very time consuming. Most cameras now that you can use, it does it all for you, which is a lot easier. Then you have virtual reality. And by virtual reality here, we're talking about scenes that you can move around, scenes that are kind of created using um, games engines like Unity um, and allow you to move through the environment, mostly done via graphics. And then we have augmented reality. So some of you may have used Pokemon Go as an example, um, which is augmented reality, where you, um, you, you take a digital object and you place it within your own environment. And AR is being used a lot more by people, seen as a way that it can reach new audiences and it can help your audiences grow um, by by being less intrusive as virtual reality and having to sit down and put a headset on. So within journalism, we've seen all these technologies being used by news organizations in different ways. And there's lots of research that suggests that we do retain more information and can better apply what we have learned by after participating in virtual reality. And that's why it's really important for news we're looking at emerging technologies like VR and AR. It adds another layer to traditional journalism, making it more impactful and memorable. And it is really important to try and familiarize yourselves with as much as these new forms of storytelling as you can. And it helps you to get a sense of what works and what doesn't. Um, so this is the example that I was telling you about before, Noni de la Pena's um, Hunger in LA. And what this does is um, allows you with high-end VR to have a look um, at this environment, this um, food bank um, in Los Angeles. Some examples that I'll send around later include this, which is six by nine, which is The Guardian. And The Guardian created this experience to show what it's like to spend 23 hours a day in a cell measuring six by nine feet. And it was all based around solitary confinement. It was their first virtual reality experience. Um, and it tells the story about um, the psychological nature of being in isolation. Um, what's important to know is that this was part of a bigger reporting project. Very rarely is virtual reality being used in isolation. It's part of a bigger story. So we're looking at things um, from features to podcasts, um, to stories, to different analysis, and then the virtual reality experience to add another layer. And that's what we need to be thinking about. How does immersive media add another layer to the story? So there's a link on this um, slides, which I'll, set, I'll send to Dev later, um, where you can follow the link and experience a story on the web browser on your mobile phone. There's Terminal 3, which is worth talking about, um, which is a great piece that was developed two years ago 
by an artist called Asa J. Malik. And this is an augmented reality piece. And what it does is it explores different Muslim identities in the United States through the lens of an airport interrogation officer. And Malik used AR here because he said it felt more real than using virtual reality. It depends more on the context. So it depends where you're watching this within your environment. For him, VR felt too dreamlike. And what we wanted to do was that application of the real environment. So this experience requires um, a high-end augmented reality headset, but it helps you to understand how the technology is being used in a different way to tell a really important story. And then finally, um, 360 degree films, and all of these can be watched on YouTube um, in 360, so either on your phone, tilt and rotate, um, or scrolling through on a web browser. And this is a really interesting project, New, New Realities, um, which is formed as a partnership between Girl Up, which is the United Nations campaign, Lenova and Ava DuVernay, who I think is a fantastic filmmaker that tells really, really important stories. And what she's done here is taken 10 stories from women across the world um, who are using technology in different ways. And the stories cover everywhere from you know, Brazil, China, France, Germany, India, Japan, Mexico, the UK, the USA and Italy. Um, so you can watch those stories um, and become part of their world to understand their world a little bit more. Now, I'm not going to have a conversation about empathy in this session, unless one of you has a question around empathy, um, in which case I'll happily answer. Um, but interestingly, Lenova um, said that in their research leading up to this project, 76% of Gen Z and 71% of the millennial respondents said that during this current pandemic, technology made them more empathetic to their communities, as well as enabling them to put themselves in the shoes of others that might have very different lives to them. So it'd be interesting for you to watch some of these stories after and see, see what that does to you. See if you do feel more connected to that story and how that storytelling is done. So those examples all show kind of immersive media in different ways. But what's really important for us to think about is place. The central character in an immersive experience is place. This is where your audience is transported to. This is what defines their experience and consequently their understanding of the story. And it's that transportative nature of the technology that's long been cited as key to experiences. VR is a type of technology that allows you to go to another time and another place, experiencing it for yourself. And the sense of being there is something that's really dominated a lot of research in this area. And with the idea that as a participant, you would feel that sense of being in the virtual environment. Through creating a focus on place, immersive journalism is able to develop without being underpinned by empathy. It takes it away from that empathy conversation. So Zilla Watson, who worked for the BBC um, VR for a long time, found this in one of these pieces, Damning the, Mile, Damning the Nile. And again, I will send you the link to this so you can watch it online. And within that, place became the experience central character. She says, you were showing people places and they could see the scale of something like the dam being built. And you could visit places that you wouldn't be able to go to. So you get a stronger sense looking around and that stays in your memory longer than you would through a television. And it's that impact that is really important that we're getting to with immersive media. It was similar in another BBC piece called Two Sisters, which looked at two sisters, a mountain trek and a wobbly wire bridge. And this was a 360 degree experience that took you to a remote village in the Himalayas. And you followed the journey of these sisters and their journey to school every day. And they would travel up to six hours a day to school and back. And the whole journey would take into account boat bridges and crossing rivers. And although the experience is about connecting you as an audience member with the sisters, 
Zilla was saying that it is much more about the place and the environment and the journey than it is around the heads and the emotion. So she asked that question, you know, does VR get you in someone's head better? She said, I'm not sure, but it certainly takes you to a place to see it for yourself and to make sense of the geography that helps you understand what's going on somewhere better. And that's one of the strongest things for news. So we've been able to write about people's experiences and the emotions and our understanding of people in stories for ages, but it's a lot trickier to do that for place. So when we start using immersive media, we can really think about that. And that shift in focus from something being empathy generating to shifting to an understanding of place and environment. And that opens up new content. It opens up new opportunities for us to develop journalism. And it allows you to hand your role as a journalist to the audience to let them see and understand a place rather than just the emotions of people in that environment. And that's really important as an area to focus on. And this brings us on to story living, which is one of my big areas of research. And this is exactly the theme of my PhD. So since 2017, we've been talking about story living, um, looking at how it's no longer storytelling, but it's a shift because we're talking about experience and the audience's understanding. And industry publications have also been picking up on this. And as we look, their talk, they extend it to storytelling in general and say brands need to be doing more than just tell a story. They need to live them. And the people are demanding experiences that truly matter. The head of production at Immersive Studio, The Void, also said the same thing. What we're really doing is moving into this new world of story living. We're creating spaces and worlds where people have a chance to live out their own stories within a framework that we design. So we still have an element of control. We still have to create that environment, but we're allowing people to live through it. Mastio and Bauman back in 2017 were arguing that this is what was really distinctive about immersive journalism. And it's that, that the audience lives the story as opposed to being told it. And through that approach of story living, it can help to expand perspectives and the audience is then left with a really powerful emotional experience. So where does, I have to bang on about this all the time, we don't watch a story, we feel a story, and I will keep saying that um, for you. Um, where is the audience? And this is what's really interesting, because I want to argue that immersive journalism is going to help save journalism and help us find new audiences. So if we look at the, um, the latest Ofcom report, and this is what we use in the UK to measure our audiences. So we use this to help us understand where journalism is, um, the state of the news industry, um, and where it might be going. And TV is still the most dominant platform for news. And I think it is going to be really interesting to look at this next year, once we've seen how engagement with the news has changed during um, this year, with obviously the global pandemic. But TV remains the most used platform for news, followed by the internet. But you can still see a decline in most areas in terms of where news is coming. And that's also when it comes to trust and that conversation and trust in the news. Um, and in this year, users of social media thought it was less trustworthy, impartial and accurate than in 2019. And again, it will be interesting to see how this might change in the next year. So users rated um, websites as more trustworthy rather than social media. But where does VR sit? And this is when we start to, to have quite, quite a, a complex understanding of our users in virtual reality for news. Because new technologies do help the industry by keeping media fresh and relevant, appealing to new audiences and strengthening relationships with existing readers. 
And we saw that when the New York Times shipped out 2.2 million headsets, um, 1.2 million headsets to all of its subscribers um, and helped them and enter virtual reality and understand it. But what we see here is the challenge, and that's a challenge in terms of technical terms and the potential of interactivity. An interactive non-fiction also presents other challenges, and among them is reception as a genre within journalism. It's recognizing that the genre would not be the same if we start opening up news for experience. But what it does do is allow for interaction, and that's really important for new audiences. There was research in 2011 which showed that 53% of millennials would rather give up their sense of smell than their technology. And this just blows me away. I don't understand this at all. But 53% of millennials, maybe some of you can shed some light on that and tell me whether that's true. Millennials are twice as likely to purchase VR headsets than their generational peers. So we're seeing that this is an audience ripe for development. But most importantly, it is a generation that's concerned about experiences. Experience is paramount to this audience. And this is a medium that is centered on experience. It's also a generation that's politically engaged but turned off from traditional news. And harnessing that can change how journalism is, looking instead of distanced, objective reporting and allowing audiences to feel and live that from for themselves. And Riot is the perfect example. So I'm not sure if many of you are familiar with Riot, um, but it's a great organization to look at. And they were established in 2012 with the goal to be the first news site linking news to action. The first VR 360 projects that they did were capturing active war zones in Syria, disaster zones in Nepal. They often partnered with mainstream media organizations before they merged with Verizon a few years back. What their focus was, was on stories that can help raise funds to transform communities and lives. It's what some of us have called hacktivism. It's that approach between journalism and activism. And what Riot did was created these experiences and had a donate, a fundraising button at the end of them to drive donations to whatever cause their pieces were focused on. And their co-founder, Brian Musa, said that the technology is the ultimate fundraising tool. So that's an organization that you should look at. There is a big question on why is it not taking off? People like me will champion immersive media, but still we're not seeing mainstream adoption. A lot of that is down to accessibility. It's also sometimes a little bit annoying to sit down and get your headset and put it on to watch the news. Um, when I could just turn on the TV or look on a news website and read it quickly. Um, so there are a lot of problems like that. Funding, resources, accessibility are key. It's not easy yet. It's not friction yet, not less yet. But those are all things that we can work on. I want to finish by talking about ethics. And this is really important that we get it right. And we talk about this early on. And the point is really well made by Sanchez Laws um, in a paper written in 2017. When journalists decide to invite audiences to witness a news event as if they were there, they acquire new responsibilities towards audiences. When audiences accept an invitation, they also must understand the responsibilities that experiencing the news event with a much higher degree of bodily involvement entails. And this is really important. We take a responsibility as a journalist to tell the story in an appropriate way. We tell it in a way that isn't harmful. We have the stories, we have pictures, we have writing, and we know how to do it. We practice to go into war zones and conflict zones and things that might cause trauma. We have to think if we are giving that responsibility to an audience, how they may do the same. And that's our responsibility and something that we have to work through. The ONA, um, and this link is on the slides, which I'll circulate, um, presented these core challenges 
for immersive media. And that's focusing around the agency and the control. It's focusing around how the stories are presented. If it's your first time within a virtual reality headset, what is the impact of that experience on you? The perception of immersive and psychological impacts are still being discovered. I know some really traumatic things that I've watched in VR, which are so embedded in my mind, and I haven't been able to get rid of them um, because they were so impactful. And that has power. That's a good thing in some ways, but we also need to understand what the impact is. The capture techniques require more post-production. And then we have that question over manipulation of the media. Is it right for us to do that? We have such a rule and a code of conduct in terms of not manipulating images. How does that work in virtual reality? There's problems around the user experience and the creators, the flaws to the technology, and also the aesthetic of a game. I don't like virtual reality games where I feel that they're car characters. I prefer the real. That's how I want to see my news. Um, and it's different for different people. And um, so what impact does that have as well? So these are all really important questions to think about, to take time to think about when we're looking at immersive media and the impact that it might have on journalism. We also have to think about the different guidelines that are in place and how it works. We have to think about technology um, neutral, like how is technology changing and how might that change our journalistic practice? We have to be, be um, no, notice that it is a changing environment and the technology is changing and we are keeping up with it as best we can, but it is difficult and it's a challenge and we have to own that. We have to think about how audiences um, will be thinking about the stories, about suffering that they might see, and that shared ethical responsibility. And then we talk about fake news. And we have to think about that in the context of VR as well, and deep fakes, and the possibility that deep fakes can be used within virtual reality, and regulations that need to be um, implemented um, to, to stop the spread of fake news, but also by using the technology. So a whole load of ethical questions for us to consider. To conclude this talk now, and then we can open it up for questions, is kind of the importance of the use of technology as a mode for storytelling is really important. It opens up new audiences to us in the same way as the internet did and in the same way as social media did. We've had to adapt and adjust how we tell stories for the internet and how we tell stories for social media. And now we have to think about how we tell stories for immersive media. Newspaper readership and other media can see declines in audiences as they spread out across media forms, but immersive is a form that can attract new audiences. The notion of immersive journalism does change the nature of news. It requires us to think differently as journalists and also as storytellers. It requires us to think more about story living creating an experience for someone that will allow them to think about a news event from a unique perspective. But there are significant challenges, both in terms of access and ethics. But even so, despite all of those challenges, it is really exciting to be able to offer the opportunity to step into a story and feel the news. Thank you very much. I'll stop square sharing my screen now. Yeah, it's been great, Sarah. Uh, questions, people, you can just uh, start asking the question. Who wants to go first? It's that moment virtually, isn't it? Where it's like, are there any hands? <laughs> no. <laughs> Anybody in the chat? <laughs> Sir, I have a question. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, ma'am. Uh, how are you, ma'am? First of all, I would like to ask you, ma'am, uh, when you uh, 
when you had done the experiment of having 48 hours of vr then ma'am what were the challenges that you had to face were there any challenges um there weren't as many as i thought there would be um so i did think i would feel sick a lot because vr can do that um I thought that I would feel quite disorientated. Um, but amazingly, it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. Interestingly, we had spoken to a lot of the big VR companies about this beforehand for support, and none of them wanted to support us. And we think that was because they were worried of the risk involved and if it would cause sickness and disorientation um but it didn't um it was a lot easier um it helped to understand how we live in an environment it helped to understand um that moment that you do lose yourself um so we all talk about presence about that moment when you forget that you are in a virtual environment and you're in a real environment. Um, and that happened a lot quicker than I thought. Um, so I, I think one of the challenges was probably, probably stepping back into reality. And that was quite difficult. Um, what I really, really wanted in the experience was I wanted to wake up because we slept with the headsets on. Um, I wanted to have that moment where is the virtual experience good enough that when I wake up in the morning, I will think that I'm somewhere else. And I didn't have that. So I was really disappointed. I wonder now if technology has improved a bit more that that might happen, um, but I'm not ready to sleep again in VR yet. Yeah, I actually wanted to ask about the image manipulation point that you brought in. Like, I mean, you're recreating something out of material that already exists, right? So why is it ethically contested that way? There's, there, there's a few different kind of concerns. Um, one of them is in the recreation of events. So I film a lot of my immersive experiences. So I do a lot of 360 degree filming. Um, so there I don't worry so much because I'm setting up my camera and I'm filming in the same way as I would with a, a 2D camera or my mobile phone. Um, so I don't worry so much in that case. I worry more if we are creating and building digital environments. If we are using game engines to actually build and recreate a scene, because does that lack the authenticity of the real? Um, does that lack what actually happened if it's from a specific view? Um, and I think that's what can be quite concerning um, in building so, so the Noni de la Pena stuff is built in a games engine. So you have the characters and the avatars, but it uses real audio. So half of it is real, what actually happened. The other half is recreated. Um, and then we, we have to, to be sure that we are, are sticking to the, the, the rules and ethics that govern us as journalists. Um, and I think that's where some of the worry is. Um, deep fakes is obviously an issue um, in traditional media as well as in virtual reality and all the worries that deep fakes can, can bring. Um, and I guess there's a question there around immersive experiences that do have more impact. Does then a deep fake within a virtual environment cause significantly more impact than it would if it was in a traditional form. Um, Ma'am, I wanted to know um, 
uh, is there some data uh, uh, for at present how many um, or what percentage of news organizations are using virtual reality and what kind of content content do the viewers want in that category yeah that, there hasn't been any recent data um so i think the best data is probably a year ago and there were um i'll send through a report because I, I don't want to, to misquote um that there, there were quite a lot of news organizations um that were developing and a lot of this was supported by the technology companies so we had projects from oculus um, HTC Vive, Samsung partnered with the New York Times. And that was a really interesting partnership because they committed to doing 360 news degree news reports every day. So they did a different story every day in 360. And that was a partnership. And all of that is sorted. Then what is the value added in terms of relevance of shifting? From, why not rely on traditional media for that, for those kinds of news? Yeah, I, I think empathy fatigue is such such a, a concern. And I think at the start, um, Chris Milk spoke so beautifully around VR as an empathy machine. And news organizations really thought, brilliant. This sounds like a lot of news stories. This is where we will do VR. And we will just do these empathy driven stories. Um, and it really limited the kinds of content that people were making. Um, so we saw, I saw so many stories around the plight of refugees. And the first few were really impactful. But then it was the empathy fatigue. It was like, I've, I've seen this. I can only understand it from my perspective. VR doesn't have the ability to help me understand it from that specific point of view, because I'm seeing it from a very privileged perspective, and it's not the same. Um, and I think that did limit a lot of stories and a lot of opportunities. Um, I think normal kinds of stories where place is the focus is key. So there was some great coverage around the American elections, taking you to specific towns for you to understand how things were happening in those towns to, to get a sense of what, what the country was going through. Um, there was some great behind the scenes at the um, in the Oval Office in the White House. Um, so it's it's about places. It's about places that you wouldn't normally get to see and and experience. Um, so different communities, um, and they may be emotional. You 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 will have an emotional response, but it's not necessarily the. I now have empathy and I know what it's like to walk in someone else's shoes because the technology can't do that. It can just help you understand a different piece, a different place, a different perspective um, and have a connection with some people in, in, in that environment. Um, but I think place is the driver um, and that can be for positive stories it can be for human interest stories. It can be around voting and, and how people are voting in a specific community and those issues rather than the, I'm going to create a story that's going to make you understand what it's like to be me, which nobody can. Yes, uh, Sarah, incidentally, one of the stories from uh, New Realities that uh, young girls who produce, uh, that's from India, yeah. Yes. And it's an extremely, you know, because I was watching on, I was watching on Oculus and um, it was brilliant. Yeah, yeah absolutely. They're really yeah. good. I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of from India, yeah. From yeah, a very they, remote village. From a very remote they, village, you know. Yeah, they're really, really well told. And again, it's yeah. about the place. It's about mm. understanding um, this environment. So. So yeah, and they're all on YouTube. Oh yeah, they're on YouTube. Right. Right. And, uh, and uh, this uh, this bunch of you know this bunch of students they get to learn this only in the from Jan. That's what they're not Perfect. familiar with. Yeah, so you're Great. actually setting up. You're just it's a curtain raiser for you. Yeah. So oh, that's fantastic! I, I'll I'll send through. I've got some of the links in the slides, so I'll send yeah. them through. Um, 
and and hopefully they'll help people start start prepping for January. <laughs> uh, Ma'am, there's a related yeah. question. Yeah, please go ahead. And when you talk about uh, uh, AR, sorry, VR's application in terms of exploding places, uh, does like have you noticed a trend? Like ideally, it sounds like a substitution for travel, and in a time that we are right now. since travel is restricted have you noticed like a jump in the technology or the adoption of vr because of the pandemic and because people are looking for that experience? absolutely i i think there has been i i don't have numbers but but there certainly has been that trend and especially around kind of conferences in virtual reality um and and that kind of adoption um I I always like to try and push the boundaries a bit more so like what why jump into VR and still be in a meeting room you know let let's jump into VR and all be on the moon um you know I I I want to be somewhere else I I want to really explore things properly I I don't want a dull cold conference room where I could be somewhere much more exciting um and yeah what why did why, why can't a beach and an igloo be next to each other you know let's yeah. take down all the rules of the world and and explore something else um but yes yeah, so certainly i think vr has really helped during um the pandemic um and i know i see a lot of travel agents um and vacation bookers have been using it a lot to try and sell holidays um tapping into people's minds and frustrations of sitting within the same four walls every day um so trying trying to use it that way too CNN's Pluto experience. I was, I was on Pluto on yesterday. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's brilliant. Yeah, that was it's brilliant. Great international space based one as well. NASA footage, you know, real NASA footage and that Pluto thing. I'll have to check out Pluto. So I have, I haven't been to Pluto. <laughs> yeah, oh, no, it's, it's, it's a, a, I'll, I'll send you. I'll send you a link. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yesterday, That yesterday I was in, I was in Pluto. <laughs> I know, and it's great when you can say that, right? <laughs> yeah, and Mars, you know, that NASA NASA has that original footage from rover, oh, wow. uh, rover lander. Then I was yeah. just exploring for three hours, and I just took some some time for me to come back to Earth. Yeah, absolutely. And and what's really good is if you you start experiencing things in that way, and then then you can actually write and produce news reports mm-hmm. from that. and and the yeah. understanding having been from what else can really help transform um your your own writing or podcast any more questions um i just had a request yeah i yeah. Uh, she's uh, sarah let me introduce her. she's doing a project on her dissertation is on vr storytelling oh so fantastic she's going to come back and badge you Oh that that's absolutely fine. So it's, yeah, it d- does d- got my email address so just drop me an email oh, yeah. or on yeah, Twitter. Sure. <laughs> absolutely fine. So ha- happy to help anyone from ACJ. Thank you ma'am. Yeah. No worries. Thank you so much Sarah it's been wonderful to have you back again. Yeah, um, lovely to see you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I will be there soon I hope one day. <laughs> yeah, because she was supposed to be guys by the way you know, she was supposed to be physically here for that Facebook thing then I was yeah. about to be at plant to drag her to ACJ and do this. Yeah, next time. As <laughs> soon as we can fly. <laughs> It was before COVID. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. Thank okay, you thank so you. much, everybody. Best of luck with everything. If you need anything, you get in touch. Thank you, ma'am. Bye. All right. Bye. 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 Do we have to leave? Jyoti, you said exploding places, no? I said exploring. Please, no. It sounded I like exploding. exploding. <laughs> That's just the latent suicide bomber in me. <laughs> Are we leaving or what? Did you uh, come up with stories for pop-up newsroom? <laughs> you volunteered for it, no? Yeah, you have been volunteered by somebody else. Defying.